So along those lines, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about both why you wrote the book and the approach you chose to take with it. Um, well, because um, when I was in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, um, I was doing stand-up comedy and uh, my manager told me to put on my Wikipedia and then I put on my Wikipedia and I was dead. <laughs> and I died of morphine overdose, which I found funny because, you know, people haven't done morphine since the previous century. <laughs> but uh, anyway, at first I was laughing about it and then I, I sort of got chilled by it because I realized, like, that one day um, what was there was uh, going to be true, you know, because, you know, it's just a, a change of tenses, you know. <laughs> it is, turns to was, and does, turns to did, and there you go. So I thought, well, in the future, when I was Norm, um, <laughs> um, you know, is this one Wikipedia page my life? And in a way it is, because you know, uh, uh, life after all is not what a man thinks or dreams, and it's just a series of, of facts. <laughs> but it's more than that also. So I wanted to get my side of the story out. <laughs> <laughs> so you did or did not do liquid morphine with Lauren Michaels in his office to get the job on SNL? <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> You don't have to answer. You don't have to answer. Um, one of the parts of the book that I thought was... <laughs> I mean, frankly, we've all done liquid morphine in, 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 in Michael's office, but um, you, you return a few times in the book to uh, actually feeling lucky for um, sort of coming where you've come from and having the career you had. And, yes. um, you know, there's a lot about being unlucky, mostly in casinos. Yes. But uh, you feel lucky about being from Canada, coming up there, and then having you know the career that took you to Saturday Night Live. Uh, can you talk a little bit about? I feel lucky coming from Canada and being able to live in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> it means you can go back easily. Well, because the United States of America is the number one country in the world. <laughs> <laughs> And then Canada, I don't know, I think it was like 16th or something. <laughs> but I, but I, come from a very, uh, I come from like dead poverty, you know? And so uh, when I was a kid, if I was told, you know, because sometimes you get jealous whenever you line up, you know, you get envy and you covet things and you, you know, you break commandments and, uh, <laughs> Like you fucking covet your neighbor's ox. You know I mean? <laughs> oh my god damn, I like that ox. <laughs> but anyway, but I always think, well, if I had been told when I was 15 years old or 10 years old or 20 years old that I would be where I was, uh, then uh, I'd be very, very happy. I wouldn't think, oh, I'll be, you know, I'll be jealous of. Johnny Galecki, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that motherfucker. This <laughs> goddamn ox. <laughs> Can you talk about how you got into comedy? Um, well, I was doing manual labor. I didn't know if there was a, such a thing as com a comics that travel around. You know, I remember I would watch The Tonight Show and I thought there was like five comics in the world. <laughs> and they would come on The Tonight Show and do it. And so then uh, I was doing manual labor and I was getting 265 an hour. And uh, I just went to this place and, uh, and uh, there was an old man there. And he never looked at me. And, and I would go, you got any work, Joe? And he goes, you got boots! <laughs> and I, I, I didn't have boots a lot of times, but I um, my feet were like where you couldn't see them. And I go, yeah, I got fucking boots. <laughs> what do you think? And so <laughs> that paid two six five an hour times eight. You did the math. That's like something like five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then this guy opened this comedy club and he's offering fifteen dollars a set. You know, you get two sets a night, three dollars. And I was like, God damn, that's good money, you know. So I started doing that. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's why I was talking about it. It was just complete serendipity. When did you realize you were good at it? First time I ever did it. Because <laughs> not, that I was, not that I was good compared to actual comics, but, but uh, you know, they have open mic nights. And so, you know, about 80% uh, of the people are mentally ill. <laughs> The comedians or the crowd? Pardon? The comedians the or the comedians. crowd? The comedians. So, if you actually know the difference between right and wrong, you're way out. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was, yeah, I was pretty good at the start. It was the only thing I was ever good at. Do you remember Joe from back then? <laughs> um, let me think. God, they're all so bad. You know, I don't want to say them because they're bad. I read Steve Martin's like Born Standing Up, and he has he was like, here's my notes from when I started up. And they were all scribbled, like notes from his first set. And they were all like classic great Steve Martin. Like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> He's good at comedy. <laughs> but um, no, I, I this is what a, a, a fucking Buddhist monk gave me this mother. <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is so cool. And then he's like, twenty dollars. <laughs> suddenly had like a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> <laughs> Gives me this, and I start hitting on girls. <laughs> um, you're just on the subject of other comedians. You have these stories in the book about other comedians that you uh, had work you overlapped with, people like Sam Kinison, yeah. or Roddy Dangerfield, Chris Farley. Can you take, talk a little bit about why those guys in particular were so unique and meaningful to you? Uh, well, to me, Roddy Dangerfield was the funniest guy ever. Like, everybody says, pride. You know? <laughs> I remember when Roddy Dangerfield died, and all the comics would get together, everybody had a Roddy joke, you know? They the best jokes there were. He had, like, you know, he did everything funny, like, you know, New comics were just punks, were just talk funny. But you know, Rodney talked funny, acted funny, looked funny, walked funny, you know, everything's funny about this guy. And uh, and then he had the greatest uh, catchphrase of all time, I get no respect, because every single person in the audience related to that. No one thinks they got enough respect. I love Sam. What about Sam and Chris? <laughs> Sam Kinison was the first guy. He couldn't get any work. I lived in uh, Ottawa, Canada, and he couldn't get any work in the United States, so he came to Canada. And he took me and uh, took me. It was kind of to, to take a liking to me. He took me across the country with him. So, but I do write one thing in the book about it. this was before he was famous. <laughs> so when he screamed and everything, it was very much different, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Such a wild shriek, you know. <laughs> and uh, so he, one time we were on the plane, and the captain goes, This is Captain uh, Brendan Johnson, and uh, we were flying, and then Sam goes, Not Crash Johnson! Ah! <laughs> Not Crash Johnson! <laughs> <laughs> that put in so many accents that his nickname <laughs> Crash. On account of the crash. All the crashes. <laughs> <laughs> And then the girls that served the little bottles of drinks were all mad. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sam had that old Sam laugh. That old Sam laugh. And Chris, did you know him at all before you started working on SNL? No, I didn't know Chris Farley, but he was so sweet and kind to me. Uh, I remember the first time I ever met him, he said he had a secret to tell me, and he took me, he secreted me to this far away from him. It's funny, I found it funny later that he took such a, such a precision to do his job. He went all the way back to his room and then he closed up the case of his you know, and it was, uh, you know, as if, as if it was a wire or something. Wire? I only know 50 words. <laughs> I'm very shrewd at putting them together. <laughs> But uh, then he said, I got a secret to tell you, but can't go past this room. Pat is a woman. <laughs> the book, I think. Yeah, it's in the book, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. 
stuff goes in books. <laughs> I should have one funny story it should be included. <laughs> it does in the contract. It's also on account of it being your favorite, it made sense to, to include it. On account of that story being your favorite SNL story, yes. it made sense to yeah. in the book. It's on account of that. <laughs> writing is easy. I said writing is easy. Writing is easy, death is hard. <laughs> I think you have a selection to read from the book. Oh yeah, I was going to read for you Yeah. Your favorite SNL story. <laughs> I don't know what another page. Oh, it's my greatest gift. There's two things I want to read. They're very short. Okay, so this is my greatest gift. Now, this is a true story, actually. Uh, some of the stories in the, in the book are not true, but this is true. <laughs> word for word true. So uh, I got a gig doing comedy at a hospital for patients who didn't pay any money, but that's not why a comic does a gig like that. You take that type of gig just because you want to be a good person and receive eternal life. <laughs> Son of a bitch to drive this long. Why the fuck they built a hospital so damn far away from everybody? I couldn't figure it. It was way out in the middle of northern Ontario where you have to pray your car to break down. If it does, you have to pray you freeze to death before the timber will respond. <laughs> well, anyway, the people who built it must have known what they were doing. After all, they owned a hospital. And I was just some guy in a car asking questions to myself. <laughs> Suddenly, in the middle of nothing, where the infinite nothing of the sky meets the infinite nothing of the snow, I saw something. A small, square, blue sign. Indicating this to getting a hospital. I was getting close. And uh, I was getting nervous too. Maybe it was the barbed wire around the perimeter. Maybe it was the armed guards. What kind of hospital was I playing? Anyway, I got my answer quickly enough because it was written on a big sign Hospital for the Criminally Insane. <laughs> My agent had never been big on detail. <laughs> it took me a while just to get in the place. First, they patted me down and took all my weapons and my drugs. <laughs> then they looked at my ass and those weapons and drugs. <laughs> Finally, they let me go from the outside to the inside. Take me to the warden, I demanded. This is a hospital, son. There's no warden. Fine, then take me to the entertainment director. <laughs> we walked down a long corridor filled with the howls of anguish and high wailing screeches. Every cage I passed had a guy in it, and every guy was acting louder than the last. The first guy was scratching his hair real hard, even though it was shorn close, as if he was trying to scratch inside his head or something. And he just kept saying, I was at John D. Rockefeller's funeral. <laughs> then the next guy was just staring at me, stone still, and he had a big smile on his lips, but his eyes were cold dead. I started laughing to beat hell. How you work with these characters all day and not crack up, I asked the organ. <laughs> oh, you get used to it. Hey, I said, what about that guy with the cold dead eyes standing there? <laughs> what did he do to get in here? Oh, well his name is Fred Henshaw. He took his mother out to the cold northern tundra where the sun never sets, and he cut off her eyelids. <laughs> that way she couldn't sleep, or even shield her eyes from the sun. Then Fred had her wander around, tripping in the snow, falling, getting back up, falling again. Every day Fred would take a hypodermic needle and remove a half a pint of blood from the old lady. <laughs> After about a week, his mother just lay down in the hard snow. Then he sat down and waited. He waited for the crows to come. <laughs> oh my god, I said, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. Well, what about the guy before him, Mr. Itchy Head? What did he do? Oh, him, trust me, you don't want to know. <laughs> well, these character shenanigans became less amusing after I heard their backstories. I was starting to get real nervous about the show, thinking that maybe these guys wouldn't be able to relate to my material. <laughs> I was shown into a room where I met the entertainment director. Listen, pal, I said, I want to do good and all, but I think this is a big mistake. When I heard this was a hospital, 
ago, I imagined sick people, really sick people, the kind you want nothing to do with. <laughs> Why, some of these fellows look healthier than you and me. <laughs> oh, don't worry, he said, you'll do fine. We had the Gatlin brothers last week. <laughs> The fucking Gatlin Brothers. <laughs> the Gatlin Brothers, I couldn't believe my ears. But then the guy showed me the room, and it was world-class, steep stadium seating, perfect acoustics. And I'd never seen such a, a fancy venue. Only one time I'd ever played a, a venue that good, and that was for a crowd made up of folks who never slaughtered a single man. <laughs> <laughs> How is it these monsters deserve such a fancy venue, I asked. Well, let me explain something, Norm. You see, technically, all these fellows are not guilty. Not guilty by reason of insanity. Do you understand? No. <laughs> Every one of these men has been found not guilty in the eyes of the law. Oh, I said. Well, that shed a different light on the situation. If these guys weren't guilty of anything, then they deserve the best show I could give them. I guess I always kind of knew that deep down. But it took the entertainment director to make me realize it. <laughs> Soon showtime arrived, and I stood in the wings, peering through the curtain. The room was made to hold about 500, but I could see there were only roughly seven people <laughs> Where is everybody, I asked. The entertainment director shook his head. I can't figure it. There's not a single other form of diversion in this entire hospital for the criminally insane. Then he looked at me mean, like it was my fault. <laughs> it's not my fault, I said. When we had the Gatlin brothers last week, he said, we had to turn people away. <laughs> Criminally insane people. It broke my heart. Well, get up, you're on. <laughs> and he pushed me toward the stage, really hard. I hit the stage to silence. Good evening, folks. How many of you own an answering machine? <laughs> A great answering machine joke. <laughs> None of us, that's how many answered one. And the other six grumbled in assent. You got any complaints Tuesday morning's meetings, the time to bring them up, Kowalski, you know that. Now pipe down, let the man speak. Is it a guard? <laughs> Anyhow, I continued, I have one, and they're more trouble than they're worth in, uh, in many ways. <laughs> I say a man phones you, and you, and then I couldn't move. I couldn't go on. One of the criminally insane men had found his way onto the stage and had begun biting my leg. <laughs> and the guard had begun striking him with a baton. And that just caused the criminally insane man to dig his teeth in deep. I started shrieking. And the audience got a big kick out of that. So the other patients began to wander into the auditorium to see what the commotion was about. By the time they finally shed my leg at the criminally insane man's team, the place was full. Everybody clapping and cheering and fighting. It was the greatest show I've ever had. <laughs> I said it's hard to read out loud. <laughs> Wait, do you want me to read the other one? Yes, please. Oh, this is my favorite one. I'm just going to read the end of it. What happened was that when you're famous, people are fucking ask you to do shit for free. And so uh, this kid had a wish, you know, he was a make a wish kid. <laughs> So he's very young, uh, uh, in a way, because he was nine years old. He only lived, he only lived to be nine. But he was very old, in a way, because he only had one year left. <laughs> so he wanted me, with his wish, was to go with me uh, on Saturday Night Live and, you know, be with me all week and see how the show uh, was run and stuff like that. And so uh, I, uh, I went there and I met the boy and uh, I told the rest of the people to scram, you know, I just wanted to be alone with the boy. And so I said, you know, I'm very touched and I'll do this thing for you. <laughs> and uh, then he said, well, I actually have a different wish. <laughs> and I was like, oh, fuck, you know, I don't have to fucking take it for two weeks in a row or something. <laughs> 
And uh, he said, no, he said, do you have Southern Canadian citizenship? And I did. And he said, uh, well, my wish is to kill a baby seal. <laughs> So anyways, we did. We went to uh, <laughs> Canada, Newfoundland, and met a, a, a child fisherman by the name of Edward McClintock. <laughs> he took us up the North Atlantic Sea, and by God, uh, the boy uh, who was, had a hell of a cough rattle. <laughs> so many pills. I was, worried. I was worried that he might not make it, and it would look very bad for me. <laughs> well, he did, you know, and he got to the, we, we found a, a flow with a, a, a baby girl. And there were gunshots, I remember. And uh, Edward McClintock said, damn, punch from St. John with their guns. So that's not how you kill a seal. <laughs> so we pulled out, out of a bag, uh, it's called a hack a pick This is a medieval looking thing, very sharp. And he told the boy, he said, you know, you, you hit, you know, the, he said, uh, uh, a seal's skull is as thin as a shadow. <laughs> if you strike it once, in the proper place, the seal will, will die in any fashion. So, um, the boy did, we watched. And a Pouring out. And it almost like it was like the blood poured into the boy. It was like the, 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 the seal's life somehow. Anyways. Me and my two buddies were witness to this wicked miracle. And that boy uh, survived. And uh, he had a complete bill of health. He, you know, it was, it was a big story in New York for, for a short time. He got to, you know, go to Gracie Mansion and meet the mayor. And, uh, I think it was Jimmy Walker at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what, but uh, he, he met the mayor and uh, he was a sort of celebrity who was on you know, and, and, and anyways, and, and hardly anyone noticed a year later when he was, uh, there's a little story in the Times about how he was uh, uh, struck by a bus and killed. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so this is a story about, about his funeral. The <laughs> boy had turned 10 years old only a few days before the accident, and now he lay in a strip that's called Tiny White Coffin. <laughs> The boy had turned 10 years old only a few days before the accident, and now he lay on Strickland's funeral home in a tiny white coffin. When all the strangers had finished looking up at him, and I'm sorry, when all the strangers had finished looking at him and sadly shaking their heads so that all present knew their feelings on the matter, his mother was left alone in the room with a tiny white coffin. Alone, but for me. I lingered behind unseen while the funeral director shooed the others into a room with a sad-faced pastor who was preparing to speak. The mother stood and looked down into the tiny white coffin. Her posture, which had been rigid all morning, went slack at the shoulders and neck. Her hands remained clasped tightly in front of her. The boy was wearing a navy blue suit and a white shirt and a tie, but he still did not look like a man. I stayed quiet in the shadows so as not to disturb the moment. After a time had passed, the funeral director opened the door and quietly let the mother know that her time was up. As she turned to leave, she looked one last time into the tiny white coffin. And then she did a strange thing, a thing I will never forget. She straightened the knot on the boy's tie and looked to make sure it was right. I took in a fast, jagged gulp of air I slunk into the next room before she noticed me. There were cookies and an urn of coffee on a table in the other room. The cookies were god awful. <laughs> None of them contained jelly in the middle, <laughs> which are widely considered the best funeral home cookies. <laughs> there were only dry shortbreads. 
coffee was black and there was no cream or milk, just packets of white yellow powder. When I poured the powder into the styrofoam cup of black bitter coffee, it just sat in a pile on the top. When I mixed the powder in with a black plastic stick, the coffee turned gray like dishwater. It got me pretty steamed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure the rest of the people who had gathered felt the same way. We all went into the adjoining room and took our seats. The tiny white coffin had been placed in the front of the room. The sad-faced pastor was standing beside it. The sad-faced pastor told us how the boy had not been an ordinary boy at all. He had been very special. He had been a brother and a son and a grandson and even a great-grandson. I looked over and I saw them sitting there, the young and the old and the older and the oldest. Sad-faced pastor told us that some things were very mysterious, but there was a meaning behind everything, even something as tragic as this. He then asked if anyone had anything they would like to say, and people came up one at a time to speak about the boy. I decided to go up and speak too, since I had experience in public speaking. <laughs> Of course, I wasn't about to do my stand-up. That would be ridiculous. I pulled out the piece of paper with a speech I had prepared. Then, when I was about to read it, I suddenly changed my mind. Folks, I said, I have in my hand here a speech I wrote that's full of big, fancy words, but I'm not going to read it. And I crumpled up my speech and threw it on the floor with contempt. You don't want to hear a bunch of fancy words. Many of them so fancy you wouldn't even understand them. <laughs> Instead, I will speak from the heart. I have never done such a thing before, but I hear it can be quite effective. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, bereaved relatives, youngsters who've lost a brother or a sister or a friend, the guy in the sad faced pastor costume, <laughs> the lady sitting beside him, I figure it's his wife. And finally, of course, the guy hanging around the door wearing a Carolina Panthers jacket is clearly in the wrong room. And has the grace to hang in there till the end. I thank you all for coming. I was proud to have known this boy, and I was, and I was proud that his last wish in life was to see me do a sketch on Saturday Night Live. Although I cannot say I was all that surprised. I am a very good sketch player. <laughs> but this is not about me. I really shouldn't be making it about me. But remember, this is the first time I have ever spoken from the heart. So I beg your indulgence. I feel this speech will really start to get good very soon. <laughs> but it didn't. And I realized something during the next 20 minutes. <laughs> As my speech moved from one main anecdote to another, none of them having to do with the boy. What I realized then was that some guys are very good at speaking from the heart, and some guys are not. It doesn't mean one guy's better than the other, just different. So I was honest with the people. Ladies and gentlemen, I said, I apologize for this speech. For the last five or six minutes, I've been telling you about Gordy Howe. <laughs> I think we all know what an awful, awful mistake me speaking from the heart was. So, if I may ask your help, let's try to find that speech. <laughs> big fancy words that I threw away some minutes ago. It's got to be around here somewhere. Here it is, a sweet old lady near the front said. I read it and thought it was very good, especially the part about how we can learn more from the children than they can learn from us. <laughs> oh, excellent, I said. I'm glad you liked that part because it's a surprise ending. <laughs> so that's shot. I guess I was going to read about the surprise ending. Also, there appears to be coffee spilled all over it. Oh yes, the sweet old lady said. I spilled co coffee all over the darn thing. Okay, well, I can't make out any of the big fancy words now at all, but it's nobody's fault. I mean, in all fairness, 
Part of it is my fault for crumpling it up and tossing it away so cavalierly. Hey, you know, I think cavalierly may have been one of the big things we did my speech. Also, it's partly the sweet old lady's fault for spilling so much coffee on the paper that not a single word could be made out. But we're not here to place blame. <laughs> I will say this about the young boy in the tiny white coffin. Despite the doctor's dire predictions, the boy was too tough, too resolute, too courageous to let something as small as a deadly disease defeat him. No, the boy was made of stronger stuff than that. It took much more to defeat him. It took a three-ton municipal bus. <laughs> Moving at 40 miles per hour. And driven by one Cecil Richard Anderson to defeat this boy. I heard the deepest of sobs and looked down to see a man wearing some sort of bus driver's hat. Too, if you cry, sir, I said, then cry with envy and not pity, for the boy is in the clouds and he is one with the clouds. It is we who are left, who are reminded of this unacceptable day, that life is swift, and yet we are blind to its mighty splendor, which can be found in the simplest of things, things like a walk in the park, a conversation with a good friend, a deep, rich coffee leavened with half cream and half milk, <laughs> served in a sturdy mug, one with some heft, and with it, a delicious cookie that's white and has red jelly in it. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and due to the solemnity of the occasion, I would ask you to hold your applause. <laughs> From there, we all went to the graveyard. The day was bright and clean, and the cool autumn air filled my lungs and made me feel healthy. The time passed, and then the hearse showed up. The pallbearers were all big men, and they carried the tiny white coffin as if it were very heavy, although it could not have weighed more than 80 or 90 pounds. There was a small hole in the ground and some dirt beside it. We stood in a circle, and the sad-faced pastor said some things in Latin, and then we formed a line. The sun was directly overhead and made the tiny white coffin ever so bright. I took a handful of dirt and flung it down on top, and then it was the next guy's turn. Afterwards, I walked back alone down a long black top road, and it was cold, and in the sky there were clouds, white clouds, and they all looked like white clouds and nothing else. I think we're going to take audience questions. Yeah, that'd be awesome. You guys look awesome. <laughs> I love what you've done with your hair. <laughs> we'll start right over here. Hey, Norm. Hi, how are you? Great. Uh, now that you are a um, can you tell us a little bit about your favorite books? One of my favorite books of all time? Favorite books in general of all time? Um, my favorite book is uh, Search for Lost Time. Uh, my favorite American book is um, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. I, I love Russian literature, and that's what I read mostly. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, just the standard stuff. You know, I, I don't like Dostoevsky, but I like the, the actual good writers. <laughs> I know. What do you like? What do you like to read? Oh. Oh, I like to read? Yeah. Um, you know, Dear Apostle Paul? Oh, yeah, I'm reading Infinite Jest right now. That's my favorite novel. Wow, how's, how coincidental. <laughs> so it's good, huh? Oh, I'm glad I'm reading it. Oh, thank you. Sometimes I give up on books, but I won't give up on that one. Because it's so big. <laughs> Sometimes big books make me sleep. <laughs> uh, do you think it's possible to be a success? Oh, it's, it's <laughs> do you think it's possible to be a successful stand-up comedian without being on social media today? Like, if you're an aspiring social uh, stand-up comic nowadays, 
do you have to be kind of like a social media whore? Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> like, what, 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 you know, that, that's my question. Oh. I got you, yeah. Um, I don't know, man, because I'm, I'm just an old man. And uh, when I came up, computers were different. <laughs> they were big. They would fill the whole room. And you would ask it questions, and then it would say either yes, no, but if you ask it like an imponderable question, it would say, this does not compute. <laughs> and smoke. <laughs> and spit from the computer. <laughs> Now, I think you probably have to be a, I don't know if you have to be a social media whore, but you have to be a, a whore. <laughs> I'm not swearing in for that. Norm, uh, oh. sorry. Oh, hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, how are you? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> um, I was wondering about the moth joke and the dolphin joke, the Alonzo and O'Brien show. Time. <laughs> I was just wondering, like, going into those story jokes, you know, the shaggy dog, whatever, um, was there an, like an agenda that you were steering away from? Like, what opponent things you guys were going to talk about? And would well, you just have me on the show just be like, come and just tell jokes because you know, you don't know you anything. Well, when Conan started, no one would go on the show. Yeah. And I started on Saturday Night Live at the same time that Conan started his talk show. And so he, he wasn't that successful, so he'd always follow me and go, the lady with the potato chips canceled, you know, that And fell in, you know. And uh, so a man only has so many stories, so I had my one. And uh, I told that on the first show. But the way the, the like, for instance, like the moth joke, I was on Conan, you know, and he said, you know, you're gonna be on one segment. So I did this segment. And then at the end of the segment, he goes, you gotta do another segment. I'm like, but I got nothing to say. <laughs> and then I remember Colin Quinn told me this joke uh, that said like a moth was into a podiatrist's office. And uh, he says, well, I have all these problems. And the podiatrist goes, I asked him, why did you come in here? And he goes, the light was on. <laughs> so I said, uh, maybe I'll do that joke, but that joke only takes eight seconds. <laughs> so I know a thing has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's what I've always heard, even though I don't fucking understand what the fuck it means. <laughs> but so I put a big, long middle. <laughs> But yeah, with Conan, you know, I, I just, what I do is, when you have to, in, in, uh, in these talk shows, they have these people called pre-interviewers, and you tell them the story, and they go to the host, and they tell the host the story, and then you tell the host the story that he's already heard. <laughs> so you feel like a goddamn fool. <laughs> so instead, I would make up stories to <laughs> And then so, you know, let me go, oh, I understand you got a haircut. I go, no, I never got no haircut. <laughs> <laughs> so after a while, they just let me do it. You know. And they were all very kind men, you know. Very, very funny men. I'm sorry, what was the third thing you said? Chris Farley? Yes, yes. And these were guys who, uh, or these are guys who are very insecure or very uh, focused on what they do and very passionate. Uh -huh. uh, and I was just wondering if, if you feel that way uh, sometimes about your own because you seem so effortless in your delivery and in kind of just putting it out there. Uh, so I'm huh. curious about that. Um, yeah, well, a lot of times people will say, like, I'm very calm and everything, but I'm not calm at all. Like, I'm frightened all the time, and I think of them dying all the time. And uh, that's my little hobby. 
<laughs> so, uh, but ruminating on your own mortality can be exhausting. And uh, so, yeah, you know, you have to figure out, you have to figure out some way to not do that. Um, but I'm not insecure at all. You know what? I'm, I'm kind of, I know I suck as an actor and shit, but then, like, I have low self esteem. But I have a, a low other people's esteem. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that motherfucker can do it, I can do it. <laughs> Hi. Are you going to ask a question? Oh. Hey, Norm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> story once, I was always wondering if it was true to the first job that Dennis Miller gave you. It, is it true that you send in one joke? Yes, it is true. <laughs> you hear that, sir? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Dennis Miller had a talk show right after he left, uh, it wasn't the HBO talk show, it was this tribute talk show after he left Saturday Night Live, and uh, hmm. we were trying to get writers. <laughs> so he, uh, so I, my manager said, you know, right, once a hundred jokes, you know, for the week. So I went to this uh, little, you know, restaurant and I'd read the newspaper and uh, I didn't really read the fucking newspaper. And uh, I was like, oh, God, I'll sleep in the middle of the night. No, 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 this seems funny to me, you know. And uh, so I'd write, like, real bad, I had real bad jokes. So anyways, I wrote 50 horrible, bad jokes. And then one joke that was okay. So I said, fuck it, I'll just send him the one joke that's okay. <laughs> because I thought he won't be able to find it <laughs> amongst all this direct. So uh, I sent him one joke. And then he thought I did it on purpose. You know? <laughs> He's like, hey, you're like Andy Kaufman, baby. And I was like, <laughs> really, I'm not a real joke. And the joke, the really joke is it was, uh, What's his name? They said Jeffrey Dahmer was on trial. And the joke was, uh, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer was on trial, and I feel his defense may be a little weak. They started it. Okay. Um, I love the Burt Reynolds impression you do. 
So a bit about Cain, like the genesis of it. He has birth, and he met Bert, as he commented. And, and just while I have this, over the 41 years of SNL, I wonder besides Farley, going back to day one, who are the players that really you most admire? Um, well, when I was a kid, I liked, uh, my favorite was Dan Aykroyd by a million miles. And I always wondered why Chevy was the star, because I thought, God damn, Dan Aykroyd can do anybody, and he's so funny and stuff. And, uh, and uh, the reason I did, I want to do Burt Reynolds, because I loved him when I was a kid. I don't really do impressions, but guys who I really like, I can do. And guys that are funny, it's kind of a cheat, but... You know, you do an impression of them, and then you're funny because they're funny. You know what I mean? So uh, I always used to watch one of the Tonight Show, and I said, I gotta give him a sketch. So then I, I uh, stole this sketch called Halfwits from Second City, and I turned that into a, a Celebrity Jeopardy. And I felt really bad for stealing the sketch. And so I waited until Mark, because Mark Short was coming on. I said, Martin, can I, can I do this sketch? I, you know, I stole it from Halfwoods. And then he said, oh, I didn't write it. Eugene Levy wrote it. And I, I had to phone Eugene Levy and ask him. And he was a gentleman about it and said that uh, I could do it. But then when I did it, you know, Lauren picks out the wardrobe. He had for like the, the, this uh, gray hair and gray beard and stuff. And I was like, no, I want to play with him from the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of odd. But, and all the time I did it, nobody ever commented <laughs> that the three celebrities, one of them was from 50 years ago. <laughs> oh, Bert, yeah, no, I met him, and uh, god damn, that guy was funny. He just told me the funniest stories, and uh, yeah, he wanted to, uh, he said he wanted to, uh, <laughs> this is a story to him. He said, you know, he could all these girls when he was young, you know, he was so handsome. And he said, one time he was in a hotel, <laughs> and there's this beautiful blonde, and she said, like, just come up to my room, you know, I have a lot of sex. So he goes up to her room, and they're kissing on the bed and stuff. And then she, he said, she whispered in his ear, and she said, I'll be right back. I have to take a dump. <laughs> Okay, we have time for two more questions before two we begin more. the signing, and we'll start right with this gentleman here. Hi, Norm. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I've read the first uh, 60, 70 pages, and this is genuinely one of the most interesting books I've read. It's sure. really wonderful, like where you, you can, it's very hard to tell what's true and what's not at times, because I know that there are difficult times, and you don't want to laugh at something that's difficult, and yet it seems like it, there's a very, it's very intentional uh, to, uh, to, to bend the truth. And I want to know how much of that came from difficult, did you try to write a very straight memoir and was that difficult or did you initially come into it knowing that uh, you wanted to have more creative? At first I tried to write a straight memoir, like, but when, when you look at your life, you know, you know, somebody once said, uh, when you look at, <laughs> I see that thing Alva said, somebody once said, Shakespeare. So. <laughs> but, uh, um, what was the other What was your question? Uh, uh, did you try to st start out trying to write a straight memoir? Uh, yes, I did, yeah. And then um, I realized, like, uh, so little happens in life. First of all, mostly it's the finding and consumption of food. <laughs> and uh, so you wake up, you eat your frankenberries, <laughs> and then you find hey, we should get a ham sandwich later. <laughs> you know, after the frankenberries digest. And then, uh, you know, you're, uh, <laughs> you're like, I gotta go to the store, man, buy me some food. 
<laughs> so uh, your life, uh, your life is just a set of mundane, uh, uh, you know, things. And so I read a whole bunch of biographies, and I really have contempt for celebrity biographies <laughs> because you know I feel there's real authors, you know, that work and are talented. And then they, you know, then they look at the best idol list and it's fucking Tim Allen. <laughs> <laughs> so I always imagine them in their cold water flats. <laughs> I don't know what a cold water flask is. <laughs> Just like angry and, you know, putting a new set. So, so anyways, I tried a whole bunch of ways of doing it. And then I thought, you know, I could, uh, I didn't want to libel it. I didn't want, I mean, I, I, I didn't care what a lot of women, but I didn't want to be sued for a lot of <laughs> So I thought if I, put, if I put actual true things in it, uh, but surrounded them by fanciful uh, falsehoods, then uh, they couldn't say, uh, you know, hey, you slandered me, because I, the way you're talking about it, the devil's in the book, like the actual, <laughs> actual devil. The actual devil makes an appearance in my book. <laughs> So, uh, so that was my plan. That's my scheme. Schemes always trump plans. I always remember that. Is there one more? Hi, Norm. Hi, finally a woman. It's about time, I say. I'm sorry. Uh, looking through the first few pages of your book, so far so good. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, who is Marilyn Manson? Who's who? Ah, Marilyn Manson. Oh, oh. oh, sorry, Charles Manson. Yeah, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, oh. oh um, <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's different people named Charles Manson in the world. <laughs> Just like there's different people named Jesus Christ. <laughs> and yet, if you met a guy named Jesus Christ, not like you're going to follow him and become a goddamn fisher of men. <laughs> but anyways, I, I, I assume you're talking about you've gotten to the dedication. <laughs> Yeah, it's dedicated to Charles Manson, not that one. Because <laughs> I knew a guy, his name wasn't Charles Manson, but I knew a guy, uh, <coughs> I, knew, I knew a guy whose name was the same as a notorious uh, serial killer. And, uh, oh man, he got a lot of ribbon about that. <laughs>